Today we are talking about information security frameworks. Uh, we are we are we are focusing very much on standards and the cyber security. We are going to talk about um, uh, those particular areas with the speakers that we have. In first and foremost, though, for those who have never been to a cyber security cluster before, just to give you an, an insight into what it's all about. The cluster's role is to support, inspire and work collaboratively with uh, fellow professionals to strengthen regional cybersecurity ecosystem. So please spread the word amongst your uh, friends and colleagues and people who are uh, new to the industry, people who are, uh, maybe have been in the industry for some time. We do want to hear from you because the whole point of this is to um, build re regional resilience, innovation and growth and nurture that cyber, uh, cyber talent. So please do invite other people to these sessions. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today's panel, um, uh, Melanie unfortunately can't be with us today. Um, so she's asked if I would step in and, and chair. Uh, my name is Gary Hibbard. Uh, I am uh, focused on many different areas of cybersecurity, but principally for the, the cluster, I look at organizational resilience. Um, we have, uh, hopefully we have with us today, Helen Goldthorpe. Are you there, Helen? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have uh, Mike Folks. Are you there, Mike? Uh, yes, he is. I can see him. Give us a wave, Mike. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, click the wrong button. Yeah, oh, that's all right. Here. Okay. You can tell where I'm going with this, guys, so get ready with that mute button. Uh, Shaz, Zachariah. Hi, hi, I'm ready. <laughs> and, ex and excited to be here. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Jason Newell. Good afternoon, everybody. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Jason. And uh, Luke uh, Keeley. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Very cool there, Luke. Cool hand, Luke. Thank you. Um, so that's the panel today. So they are there to uh, to assist uh, always. Uh, but we have some great speakers. Um, we have uh, David Parrish. David, say hi. Afternoon, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. Chris Murray. We have Chris with us. Good afternoon, everyone. And we have Philip Grinning as well. No, hi, good Excellent, thank you. I'm going to do um, uh, more introductions for uh, each of the Hello, uh, speakers that we have as well. So um, if I could just, again, just ask people if you could keep yourselves on mute um, throughout just in, so we don't get any background noises whilst the speakers are speaking, that would be awesome. Uh, but if you have any questions, please do um, ask them in the, in the chat. Uh, next slide then, please. So. Today's agenda, there is nothing new in this world. Uh, we'll come on to that uh, in a second. Um, we're going to be talking uh, standards, uh, standards and standards. That's the whole purpose of today. We're going to take a look at ISO 27001, a standard which I think most of us um, uh, have heard about. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, cyber essentials. So, first of all, uh, David, Parish, uh, there is nothing new in this world. So before David talks through his uh, his slides, um, I'd just like to do a bit of an introduction. So David is the founder of Coordinated Risk Solutions (CRS), who specialise in holistic risk management approach using international standards um, uh, ISO frameworks as the basis of complete improving efficiency and effectiveness and economic um, in an overarching business strategy. Standards are designed for individual and businesses uh, by business specialists from across the globe. So that's who David is, that's where he's from. And um, David, over to you, sir. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be presenting this afternoon. I hope, as I put on LinkedIn, I don't crash and burn. Uh, but. Uh, what, what I'm looking at here is that when I say there's nothing new, if we actually ask the question and we look back a little bit in history, obviously we're moving forward, what are we actually trying to achieve in cyber security? And maybe it's the questions incorrect, uh, because what we're all 
in my belief, is we're all looking at harm reduction. Yeah, we're looking to reduce the harm. We know what the threats are. We can assess the risks, but how does that harm uh, affect individual organizations and businesses? So uh, I better do the quick uh, slides on the left before I go. So Marmite is, you know, whichever role you're in or however you sit, uh, it's my personal favorite nickname about myself. But, uh, you know, there is an element of love it or hate it, but we're, we're all going to have to try and do it and influence those that hate it or, or don't understand it. Uh, the second slide is my favorite, and that's history, which is Anacapa Island, where the mist clears every morning and clarity is formed, which is the history, basically, around intelligence and understanding intelligence. And then the last one, he nearly came to join us because his uh, grandmother was late, so she's just turned up, so he won't be as none of us are Batman and my able assistant, Robin, uh, won't be with us. So if we move on then, my, my theory is that if we look broader at what are we trying to reduce, what harm are we trying to reduce, and all of the media, we can't manage the media, we can't control it, but what we want in the principle is we're looking at data privacy and uh, other speakers will go in a bit more detail. Uh, generally looking at protecting the individual or your client. And then we're looking at data security and the various harm reduction strategies that we try and put in place, because that's what we're going to do. Uh, those are inextricably linked. So when you go to your ISO standards, and you look at it, it's actually common sense. You know, they're fairly straightforward framework that you can apply. Now, you don't have to apply it all. You don't have to make it a bureaucratic, as some suggest. It actually is done by us people. People here will have contributed or know it. You know, it's a fairly straightforward framework that actually is looking at reducing business harm. So fortunately, in the pre-brief, and you'll see this with Gary, we are synced in the cyber cluster, even though it's my first, because I've put a wheel of harm up, and I think Gary's got a wheel as well. But if you went round this wheel and you looked at it, at some stage, you will have had to have looked at, how do I come up with something that will help reduce the harm that might be caused? And so you can pick them. They're all ISO standards. Uh, they're cyber essentials. It, it's the same language. Uh, and the advantage with ISO is that it's international. So therefore, if you're phoning someone and talking about ISO globally, which is what we're doing, no one's actually working just in Yorkshire anymore, you know, despite what we think at least you're having a common conversation. You know, you're speaking, uh, and I've had experience with this where you've looked at contract renewals and it's come through the various elements and you've ended up, it's all very complicated, and you actually go through the email chain, find the risk person at the other organization who's generated this. You have a 10 minute conversation, it's resolved because you're speaking the same language. You know, and ISO gives you that, and it's translated, similar to the GDPR, which people go on to, or data protection. It's written for 27 countries with different languages. So it actually translates. So if you look at it, all you can really do is you can only make your decision, and this is why I default to my preferred thing which is intelligence led harm reduction information designed for action this morning you will have a coming plan and a piece of information from whatever may well change that decision making so the best possible and if you've got a strong framework that is what your iso brings to the party uh, and you can you can adopt that because you can't build a house without decent foundations. You know, uh, 
and and it's it's that language thing. So I'm just going to spin my wheel, and really, what harm are we actually trying to do? You know, we we know business continuity, Jason. I think someone's going to pick up on that business resilience. We've all gone through that, but actually, there's loads of people who do this every day. They're already doing their business resilience, but it gives you more flavor of what you can. The challenge of business resilience, communication, language. How do you communicate it? How is it understood? Uh, data protection, uh, lovely. Data protection, it's privacy. We all want, historically, we've all expected confidentiality. We don't want people sharing our stuff, whether it's the secret you told at school to someone. Now it's all over the internet. But it's the basic principle, confidentiality. And I think I'm, Gary's going to wave. I think I'm at four minutes. So I'm looking at him because uh, you're only allowed five minutes and one slide on this event so that you don't have to last too long. So I'm just going to pick on my wheel the one because I don't believe in scaremongering. The one thing for data protection that no one wants is a restriction on data processing. Everyone talks about the fines. Everyone talks about it. But in that legislation, paragraph one says it is intended to enhance the free movement of data. That's paragraph one of the data protection legislation. Paragraph two is the bit that causes the bits of concern, as long as you've got suitable controls. I'll leave those controls to everyone else. But the worst one you could get, you can maybe suck up the fine, uh, is they turn around and say, stop processing. It's in the legislation. Various European uh, people have done it. They've even done it to the Dutch VAT authority and told them, if you don't get your act together, you're not going to be able to process VAT, which for some of the people on this call would be joyous <laughs> as long as they do the refunds. Uh, mm. And then the other one, what we're really, just to finish up, what we're really talking about is reputation. The bad restaurant meal that everyone knows about, you tell 10 people. Yeah, the good restaurant meal you tell the person you've gone for the meal and you end up by saying that wasn't a bad meal. So I think I'm in time, Gary. He's Thank nodding. You. Yeah, that's perfect. No, I completely agree. And interestingly enough, you're talking about there, you know, you use the, uh, the term intelligence led harm reduction. I think most of us will have come across the term, um, you know, threat intelligence and, you know, know that the importance of, of identifying threats and opportunities and having a, a methodology to do that I think is is key. So um, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions, really quick, um, if you could answer these. Um, so, what do you think is a good approach to reducing harm? If you could boil it down, so, to basic yeah. Elements. So, if you go back and actually look at the beginning, build your blocks from the beginning. You know, what are you? What harm are you trying to reduce? Yeah, and if you look back, whether you do it academics or anything, look back to you know a routine activity theory, something like that. You know, uh, you've got a, an offender, a victim, and a location. That's still still pre prevalent, whether it's on the internet or not. So mm -hmm. if you understand your basics, and people go, I'm going to get ISO for whatever reason but if you actually ask the question i've asked it and maybe lost some contracts on it i'm saying what harm are you trying to reduce because if you don't understand what you're trying to protect properly and you're not all on the same song sheet you can spend a lot of money putting a lot of fixes in but your fundamentals is who's the victim who's the perpetrator and how they're going to do it okay so what would you say is the challenge so you're challenging all of this, and I go back into my history of uh, of law enforcement and and things like that. It's I call it your MR2D. Yeah, you're matching resources to demand. It, everyone here will come off this call, and they will have more in the inbox. Not enough people 
to really, really unpick the root cause. You know, why mm. did it happen? And really unpick it. And if you get that time, okay, do the quick fix. Everyone does the quick fix, but put the quick fix, whether it's your team meeting, your sprint, your buzz, and take that ability to get your resources uh, so that you can actually unpick it so you're reducing it happening again. Because okay. unfortunately, best will in the world, people are the most expensive commodity and you've it's very, very hard to show value. So matching resources to your demand is the challenge and it always will be. Okay, so I've got one question for you. Uh, Luke Keeley uh, Keely's uh, asked the question. Um, do does safety uh, need to be added to the um, the triad, the CIA confidentiality, integrity, and availability? Do you think we should add safety to that? Well, I think what you're looking at there is is it's. I could do a whole slide on my rule of three. Uh, yeah. which if you're short but uh, safety is is part of harm reduction isn't it you know uh, mm. and you can add acronyms and and we all suffer from it well, it's so be a focus i think that's the thing that luke's suggesting and by the way when people do put the question into the uh into the chat feel free anybody wants to uh throw in their opinions um but i think you know, you're right. It, you know, we can throw in acronyms and such, but confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and maybe yeah. now safety needs to be that elevated up, so it is a focus. Well, well, I think uh, Gary, as we discussed with the team before we started this, I had another another more complicated slide that wouldn't have worked here, where I added, which people might not be aware of, uh, and it is worth looking at under the safety, as Luke suggests. Uh, if you have a quick look at the ISO 45, I'll get the numbers wrong, uh, but if anyone wants it, the ISO committee have given what, have published a very quick standard, which is common sense again around the coronavirus mm. and specifically around safety. And it it gives that ability for you to say, you know, so safety is, is actually in the ISOs. Yeah, I think... It, it's in there, but I, t I agree with Luke, you know, if you actually said confidentiality, integrity, availability and safety of your organisation, your people, it would probably resonate better with who you're delivering it to. It's a very good point. No, thank you for that. No, that's brilliant. Thank you, David. That was uh, really interesting and a great way to, to start the, uh, the conversation. So... Moving on then uh, to Phil uh, Brinning uh, of uh, Data Protection People. Again, just by way of introduction, um, Phil Brinning is the founder and director of Data Protection People, which is a Leeds-based consultancy business that helps organizations all over the UK with managing their compliance with data protection law and standards such as uh, PCI DSS and ISO 27001. During his career, Phil has worked at both Everton and Leeds United football clubs. We won't hold that against him. Uh, <laughs> the hotel and catering industry, publishing and in both the food and furniture manufacturing industries. And just for clarity, I know nothing about football. So I just threw that in there just in the hope it would land. But anyway, so uh, Phil, I'm going to leave that to you now. So standards, standards and standards. Thank you, Gary. Yes, hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting me today. I'm just going to start my timer so I can monitor my progress. Um, when I think about standards, and there's some excellent um, material there from, from David, uh, I categorise them into three types. Uh, legal or regulatory standards, which is the law, such as the UK GDPR or the EU GDPR, as we now have them, information, sort of network and information systems regulations, the payment services regulations. We've got contractual standards, those imposed by contracts you have with other organisations such as the payment card industry data security standard um, or contracts, you, know, you might have SLAs with your suppliers. And then we've got voluntary standards, so standards that you choose to adopt because they add some value to your uh, organization. Um, and effectively these standards codify and articulate either a baseline of acceptable behavior or they very prescriptively define what behaviors you need to be exhibiting. Um, so let me give you a couple of quick examples. The, the, the PCI DSS is very, very prescriptive. 
and sets out exactly what must be done to meet the standards requirements. And requirement 6.1 says that critical security patches must be applied within 30 days of publication. Uh, daily checks must be made of computer logs and uh, points of interaction devices and quarterly scans must be made of available um, Wi-Fi networks in the in the uh, cardholder data environment. Um, but often you find that, that there's overlaps and conflicts because Cyber Essentials, for instance, requires patches to be applied within 14 days, not 30 days. And, and often you know, legal standards such as the GDPR are even more woolly. They just require appropriate security measures to be implemented, not really setting out what those might be. And instead, from my point of view, which is great, allowing each organization to set its own standards and expectations but that means you've got to have a risk management system in, in place as a, as a core feature. In, in some cases, uh, one standard provides a suitable framework for another. For example, if you handle credit card information, then the PCI DSS is the standards of requirements to address that risk. And even that's graduated though. So if you store cardholder data, you might have more controls to apply than if you don't. Um, but uh, the PCI DSS doesn't apply to managing debit direct debit information, for instance, just credit card data. So we've got these different standards doing all these different things. And if you read the ICO's monetary penalty notice issued to the Marriott Group, it was really interesting to note that the ICO factored into the calculation of the fine as mitigating circumstances, the fact that Marriott relied on the reports on compliance issued by their PCI DSS QSA company, the Qualified Security Assessors. So risk had been assessed and the PCI FDSS deemed to apply appropriate security measures. And this tells us that conducting independent audit to comply with one standards might have a positive impact on another. But we've got to be aware the boot can be used on the other foot because the ICO um, factored in the fact that um, car phone warehouse was not PCI DSS compliant as aggravating circumstances following their data breach. And really what I wanted to talk about today was really to, to, to tease out the fact that there are common elements to all of these standards, things that you must have in place in any kind of system, if you like. Um, and I also wanted to sow a seed of the notion of building an integrated compliance and management approach. So creating controls that address requirements of multiple standards. Uh, one incident management process, for instance, that incorporates provisions to determine if a personal data breach has occurred and whether or not it's notifiable. One audit program, one training and awareness program. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, it's obviously sensible to have a procedure for selecting on onboarding suppliers, but when I'm out and about doing what I do, I very rarely see a process that combines getting the commercials right and incorporates both financial and information security due diligence. Um, that also folds into contractual terms, the GDPR requirements or the PCI requirements or the ISO requirements in, into one agreement. And it is possible to integrate these elements into a single process and there are benefits for doing so, such as you know, one way across the whole organization of selecting, appointing, managing, and decommissioning suppliers. Another example might be, for instance, um, inventory of assets, where the GDPR requires a register of data processing activities. Um, the accountability framework that the ICO has published expects us to maintain a register of information assets, but that's entirely focused on personal data. The PCI DSS, on the other hand, requires merchants to maintain an inventory of assets, but only those in the cardholder data environment. And that includes firewalls and servers and switches and laptops and point of interaction devices and, and, and other things. And different again, ISO 27001 requires an inventory of information of other assets associated with information and information processing facilities. So if you can corral all that information together, uh, there are there are benefits to be had and really what i wanted to, to try to point out today was that it's certainly an approach that's gaining traction um, and there's quite a few standards out there to help map the various standards across each other it's certainly something worth thinking about and my five minutes are up gary yeah i was just going to say that uh, philip was you, you that your time of just telling that you're done so that's brilliant well thank you for uh for being so on, on on the ball there and on time. Um, but I do have a couple of questions um, because everything you just talked about there absolutely dovetails into what uh, David was saying. Again, the word integrated came up. Um, you know, it's about reducing that harm and, and you know, removing gaps. So um, we've been getting mixed responses about the impact of COVID-19 on PCI DSS. 
um, assessments and such. So just deal, I want to deal with that because that was something that when I saw your what you were going to talk about, I'd be interested in your views around that because I'm, I'm sure many people on here today have got PCI DSS. Has the standard Security Council approved remote assessments? Um, kind of. What, what they've said is that where they can be carried out with the same integrity as an on-site assessment, then a remote assessment is possible. But what that means in practice depends on the payment channels and, and the merchant and the acquiring banks. So, for instance, we've got a, a retail customer in Guernsey who stores cardholder data and therefore requires um, to have an assessment of the physical security relating to their cardholder data environment requirement nine and we went out in october to do their report of compliance and did everything except physical security and then lockdown happened and we had to hot foot it out to guernsey otherwise we'd have been locked down there for a couple of weeks um, and we spoke to the acquiring bank who's global pay and what they've told us that we must do uh, an assessment in person uh, and in the meantime because we cannot attest to their compliance we've been instructed to put the customer on to what's called a prioritized approach which is effectively kind of protected status for non-compliant merchants and an action plan of how to get back into compliance. Um, by contrast, I undertook a, a report on compliance for a service provider in September. I did virtually all of it remotely. So it really depends on kind of the, the merchant and their configuration and the attitude of their acquiring banks. It's, it's, it's possible, but it, it's not a, a given. What, what would your advice be then, just to speak to your assessor? No, you, well, you've got to speak to your acquiring banks, make the decision. So you, your assessor, if you've got one, you know, can advise you. I yeah. think but ultimately you need to talk to whoever it is that's your acquiring bank, and they'll 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 tell you what you've what you can do. Okay. So moving the conversation on then to um, GDPR, because I know that's a particular focus for data protection people. Um, I read something about the changes to international transfers of personal data following SHREMS two. Um, uh, now that Brexit mm. transition period is over, will that affect uh, the UK? Will it affect us or not? Yes, uh, yeah, it will do. So, um, uh, it's essentially, the strange judgment, the European Court of Justice held that the, the trans one of the transfer mechanisms that, that a lot of people relied on called Privacy Shield didn't provide sufficient protection to people's rights and freedoms for transfers to the United States. Uh, and the UK agreed with this stance. And if you recall, the Privacy Shield was a self-assessment code of practice adopted by US companies, uh, which was considered to provide adequate safeguards and, and therefore a legal gateway for transfers of personal data to make from the UK and the EU to the USA. But the, the Privacy Shield was, was kind of the, the lack of protection afforded by the US legal system for data subjects um, and the potential for indiscriminate hoovering up of personal data by the US authorities. Uh, led to the kind of striking down of it. And uh, lots of popular platforms like MailChimp and SurveyMonkey and Hootsuite and tons of others relied on Privacy Shield to permit and to kind of provide that legal gateway for transfers from the EU and the UK um, to controls uh, to, to uh, organizations in, in the US. Um, so in, in November, I don't know if you're probably aware, the European Data Protection Board um, issued new standard contractual clauses um, for international transfers. And what that means is that there's going to have to be a repapering when these come into effect of all the international transfers you might undertake. And, and they went a step further, they said you have to have additional safe, safeguards in place. So, for instance, you've got to ensure that all data transfers are uh, encrypted and that the recipient in America isn't capable of decrypting them. Uh, in addition to that, you've got to assess the territory. Um, that you want to send data to or transfer data to. So you've got to assess each country that you want to transfer data to and consider whether their legal framework, I mean, it's highly complicated this, legal framework and culture provides um, guarantees that the Europeans consider to be essential. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's a lot of complication. And the Brexit angle means that at the moment, the UK has its own version of the GDPR um, which determines anything outside of the UK as a third country. And, and at the moment, the EU is working on granting uh, an adequacy decision to the UK. And if we get that, then transfers from the EU to the UK will be fine. And if we don't, it means transfers from the EU to the UK will be also subject to international transfers. It's, it's a very complicated and moving area at the moment. Sorry, it's a rambling answer, but it's, it's, a, it's a big question. 
Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, uh, Andre has just asked an interesting question. If you've got your crystal ball out, it would be awesome. Uh, will the UK retain its adequacy status? Well, I think it will be. I, I think it will be granted adequacy, um, and I think that my personal view, but I might be having a political colouring here, is it will be used for political means to move the UK to where the European Union wants us to be. So, you know, if we lost adequacy, it would be a, a major disruption to European uh, organisations transferring data into the UK. So. I should think we'll get it. You know, we've got a good framework. There's a few things in there that, that might cause us a hiccup, but I don't think we've got this far in the Brexit transitional process, you know, without there being hope of, of having that adequacy awarded. Okay. Um, I can see David has his hand raised. So very quickly, David, could you ask your question? Phil, uh, I think I saw something this week to say adequacy statement is virtually going to be ratified. Uh, after they've kicked, the, as you said, after they've kicked the political football about, I think they published this week to say that they're going to accept our status, which alleviates yeah. for a lot of people. Okay. So just, just before you answer the question, Phil, um, Helen, um, you're our uh, our legal expert on the panel. Could you just you I see you yeah. your hand as well? I was I was going to say the same thing that okay. the the update I saw is that a draft decision is expected possibly this week. Um, it then goes to the EDPB for review, but my understanding is that they don't have too much to say. They can comment on it, but they can't veto it. Um, so it does look like it, it's going to happen. The interesting thing for me is whether someone like Schrems starts attacking it. Um, but even in that case, it's going to take a couple of years to work through the courts before. Um, so if anything gets invalidated. Okay, and um, finally then I'll just go to uh, Andre, I can see you've got your hand raised there. Yeah, have you unmuted? Okay, do you, do you have something? Okay, fine, that's fine, no problem at all. Okay, brilliant. So. Uh, uh, that was fantastic. So thank you for that, um, uh, Philip. Much appreciated. And I think hopefully you can see where we're um, we're, we're taking you here. Um, David has given a broad overview of um, the landscape in which we we all should be thinking about and operating that threat intelligence, that um, you know the uh, horizon scanning, if you like, and how we should be working towards improving our resilience um, to all these things, these things that are, are being put before us. And Philip's just done a great job in, in really encapsulating what we talk about when we hear about standards, you know, standards, standards, and more standards, you know, you know, what, uh, when we talk about standards, what do we actually mean? So I wanted to bring this conversation a little bit tighter on some of the things that um, some of us will be very aware of. And I know Mark, uh, earlier did a great link to um, a handbook uh, that's um, available on Amazon. Uh, I don't know if it's an affiliation, Mark, but it is a great book. Uh, I have read it, um, as I'll read most books no, about. Uh, <laughs> not, I'm not taking uh, any... Um, any credit, any, okay. Any credit. Right. I've just, I just saw it, and uh, it's great to have, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of mysticism at times around this standard because it is relatively generic and uh having an insider's track on uh, somebody who's actually audited and uh, composed a lot of these management systems you've got all that inside track in this book for 30 in, quid indeed i think it is a very very useful resource so i would agree with mark if you're if you're confused about uh, iso 27001 then go out and buy this book or seek uh, assistance now it's interesting mark um just uh, came in there because he's right you know there is a lot of ambiguity and confusion around ISO 27001 I hear people all the time say to me um, they either say it's too vague and it's too broad for it to be applicable and um, it's not technical that it is uh, you know that you don't have to have a technical understanding um, uh, to be able to apply it and I would agree with that to to some extent um, but then I've heard other people say it's too complicated, it's too complex, 
um, I can't do it. I'm only 10, I'm a company with just 10 people or I've only got 50 people or I've only got two people. Now, just to be clear, I've been working with 27,001 since the very uh, beginning of 27,001 and before. So it was BS77991 uh, and two. So I've been working with this for a very long time and I've helped organizations implement 27,001 as small as one person who wanted to be ISO 27001 certified, all the way up to tens of thousands of people in a global um, organization um, with many multiples of um, uh, instances around the world. It is a uh, complex um, standard if you want to make it such. What I would always say is that um, the hammer in the hand of a amateur will always be destructive so in the hands of a craftsman if you put uh, a hammer in the hands of a craftsman they will create you something beautiful so when i say to people if you want to do diy with iso 27001 then have a guide like this the handbook that mark referenced earlier or have someone to guide you on this uh, this uh, process because it is largely principle based um there are rules within it which i'm going to talk about in a second but principally for those who have never looked at iso 27001 in any kind of detail what you should do know is that all the standards now are all based around something called annex sl and this structure is all the standards now from uh 22301 through to 9001 45001 and all and all the others that are going through this iteration process all have a context of organization they all have leadership they all have a planning support operational performance evaluation and improvement section so with this this structure it brings to the the um possibility of some of these things that david and philip's already mentioned which is a truly integrated approach to um, uh, cyber security, business continuity, quality. So an integrated management system is now easily within our grasp. And what I would say to anyone out there thinking about ISO 27001 is, you need to think about your organization, the context of your organization, and how this, uh, this applies to you. In very much in the same way that GDPR under Article 32 talks about appropriate technical and organizational measures, it uses those sorts of words as well. So you need to put in place what is appropriate to you and your organization, remembering that it's a risk based system. Now, I would also just urge you to take a look at the um, uh, the uh, down the left hand side of your screen, the context of the organization. And I'm not going to go through each one of these, but simply to say, if you do not understand the context of your organization, if you do not, if you cannot describe the environment in which you operate, then I would be very surprised because most of us should be able to, and especially as business leaders should be able to, and therefore should be able to define the scope quite easily. Straight after context of the organization is leadership. And I tell my clients, if you do not have the resources in place, the commitment to implement 27001, then stop reading, stop doing this because you're going to fail. The fish rots from the head down. So unless you have that leadership right at the forefront, then you're not going to go anywhere, let alone getting to those 114 controls that you can see on the wheel in front of you. As David said at the outset, you know, he had a great wheel on his, which talked about business continuity. He talks about compliance. He talks about third parties. 27,001 can be drawn up in the same sort of way. You need to be able to assess and understand your organization through these controls. They are not prescriptive. So they do not say to you, you must um, have a, a, you know, a technical uh, vulnerability assessment on an annual basis. It uses words like periodic and regular reviews and such. So it's down to you to determine what that means. And I see it time and time again where organizations trip themselves up by writing into policies things that they're just never going to be able to comply with and that's because of the fact that they thought well it says i have to do this periodically well i want to say that i'll do it on a monthly basis and then they fall foul of it and then they complain that the standard is too complex so i think what we need to remember is that iso 27001 
can be as complicated as you want to make it. And that's true of all ISO standards. And I often say to people that ISO simply stands for, I'm so organized. And that's what it's about. It's about making sure that you are organized and um, thinking about risk in the context of security. And that's ISO 27001. Um, so there you are. So I don't know if there was any questions there as I was speaking, Mark. SOA is the document you list all the controls you have are implementing to mitigate the risk against your assets in scope. Uh, the wheel, Gary, shows the control areas. Yeah, absolutely. So your statements of applicability, you would look at those 114 controls and say, how do these apply to my organization? And then you would determine if they, if they apply or if they don't. And if they don't, you'd have to give a reason why. Um, you're absolutely right, Mark. The plan, do, check, act model is, um, is still there. However, however, it has been removed out of 2013 stroke 17. Uh, it's still there in the 2005 version, um, but some auditors do still like to see that you have that methodology in place. Um, what are your thoughts on IASME governance versus ISO 27001? Um, I think IASME, uh, well, I have to, open disclosure. I know some of the guys uh, on the board of IASME. Um, I think all standards have their place and they all have relevance. And I think it's down to the individual or, uh, individual business, how they want to apply that. I think it, time will tell to see how IASME develops. I would say is, uh, what I would say is that they have definitely improved over the last couple of years. And, uh, and with that, um, uh, that's a nice way for me to actually finish what I'm going to say and uh, move on to our next speaker. Because Chris Murray, um, you're right, Mark, you can combine the best bits of each. If you don't want to go for formal certification, you can simply align to the standard. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that uh, many organizations do. So we've taken you from the high level and we're gathering you down, looking at some more focused areas more prescriptive areas and I want to now like to pass you on to Chris Murray um, and Chris uh, by way of introduction is the co-founder of Yorkshire based Bleem Cybersecurity. He's a lead assessor for the Cyber Essential Scheme. Now Chris has extensive experience working across information security including insourcing a large managed network service uh, security service for, for one of the largest banks in the UK. Uh, Chris is both a Certified Information System Security Professional, a CISP, and Offensive Security uh, Certified Professional, and is accustomed to assisting organizations both with implementing uh, security uh, strategy, uh, to strategy, governance frameworks, and also on technical consulting and security assessments. So Chris, uh, with that, I would uh, like you to talk about uh, Cyber Essentials, if you will. Yeah, thank, thanks, Gary. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Cyber Essentials is a government backed cybersecurity standard um, and it's designed for organisations of all sizes to implement to help to protect them from commodity based Internet born cyber threats. And it's probably worth going into a bit more about the background of where Cyber Essentials came from so you understand where it fits in into the grand scheme of things. So back in 2013, the government conducted some research to understand what cyber security standards were available to UK businesses. And the conclusion of that research was that effectively, well, there's not really much out there at the moment. Um, we have IASME governance, we have ISO 27001, and they, they were certainly the best standards at the time, but it wasn't what they were looking for. They were information assurance and information security standards and frameworks. What government were looking for was something that was very specific and a cyber security standard, not information assurance. And when you think about information security versus cyber security, cyber security is really a component of information security, albeit a very large one. And it will obviously it continues to grow as, as we continue to use technology more and more. So on the back of this, between government and several other organisations, including IASME, who are the current accreditation body, the current and sole accreditation body for Cyber Essentials, um, they created the Cyber Essentials standard. So Cyber Essentials is split into five specific controls, which you can see there, and I'll talk through them in a bit more detail. But effectively, there are two levels of Cyber Essentials, the Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus. So if you want to go down the Cyber Essentials route, um, it's based on a self-assessment questionnaire and it's all questions around these five areas of controls and of course the scope. 
if you want to take, take that further and once you've achieved Cyber Essentials certification, you can then go and do Cyber Essentials Plus, which involves internal and external vulnerability scanning and some other security assessments just to ensure that you, you've actually implemented it correctly. So looking at the controls in some more details, obviously scope, as with any standard, really important. Where, where are we applying this to in the business? Are we doing the full organization or are we doing a small part of the organization? And depending on your business, and um, really that, that will determine what you choose to do. Logistically, it can be sometimes difficult to achieve full, full scope. Um, but overall, these are much more specific. And, and when you compare it to something like ISO 27001, which acts as a really good framework to help you start implementing information security and cybersecurity, this is really addressing more specific things. So for instance, access control, um, we'll look at things like how are you provisioning administrative access? Do you ensure that user accounts don't have admin directly assigned to them? Um, do you have strong password policies? Firewalls, um, so we, we, here we'd look at the external boundary of your organization to ensure that, you know, making sure that the firewalls are not accessible or the configuration of the firewalls are not accessible over the internet and making sure that you don't have any externally advertised services where you don't have a sufficient business justification. Secure configuration, we look at end user devices, be it mobile or Windows desktop devices, Mac, Apple and so on. Here we're looking at things like, is auto run and auto play disabled? Uh, do you remove software that's unused to remove that residual risk? It's all really, really specific. Um, and patch management is a good example here because that's that's directly referenced within 27001 on this statement of uh, applicability. And what ISO 27001 talks about is making sure that you, you do update your software, you patch your software, but Cyber Essentials takes it one step further in saying that you need to be installing all high risk and critical security updates within 14 days of release. So it, it, it really does fit into ISO 27001, it's just that much more specific. And finally, malware protection, and again, that covers all types of devices, be it mobile or desktop devices. Now, interestingly, I, I actually uh, worked with a client recently who they'd, they'd gone through ISO 27001 and they decided to go down the Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus route, and they, they assumed it was going to be a walk in the park, but they spectacularly failed because when you're doing something like an implementation with ISO 27001, you're very much reliant upon the expertise when you're conduct, conducting those risk assessments to identify what your cyber risks are. So in actual fact, cyber essentials is, is really good to implement alongside something like ISO 27001 because it, it can really reduce specific and targeted cyber risks. Lancaster University actually did a study um, into the effectiveness of the Cyber Essentials control. So they built an environment that was essentially set up to be compliant with the Cyber Essentials standard. And they ran hundreds of simulated attacks against that environment. And it actually mitigated, I think it was around 70% of attacks were fully mitigated and 30% of them were partially mitigated. So there were some real benefits into, you know, to implementing these controls. But I think overall, with all of these standards and, and certainly in particular cyber essentials, when, when you think about why we implement cybersecurity and why we implement information security, is to prep is to protect assets, is to demonstrate that we've we've done the right thing, we've taken, you know, we've, we've done due diligence and we've got legally defensible security. And that's why I've put a picture on there of Cafe Pacific. So recently. Cathay Pacific were fined £500,000 by the ICO um, and as, as part of the uh, notice for prosecution, the ICO actually quoted that Cathay Pacific had failed to implement four out of the five basic cyber essentials controls, which is really important because it sets a precedent in the sense that the ICO are actually using cyber essentials as a benchmark to determine, you know, have Cafe Pacific taken the right due diligence, have they put in best practice cyber or, or cyber, certainly cyber, which we would, we would expect to see as a minimum. And because they hadn't, that, that, that subsequently led to them being prosecuted. Um, and certainly, I think from my, from my own experience, I, I see this cyber essentials requirements popping up more and more in public sector contracts. So if you want to work with MOD, um, a lot of the NHS contracts now that involve patient data, they will be mandating cyber essentials. And, and we see the same thing in the private sector as well. So I think in summary, it's a great scheme and it's a great standard and it really does work well alongside something like ISO 27001 and especially where you don't necessarily have the internal cyber expertise to help you identify specific 
cyber risks. Now, I know this is only brief, but hopefully, I'd, I'd, I think, will it, will it be possible, Gary, to send out the uh, a link to the self-assessment questionnaire so people can get a... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, if you've got that, put it on there. Um, I do know uh, Alex has got his uh, hand raised if you'd like to ask a question, Alex. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, just to just to bring something else up that um, Chris sort of alluded to there with regards to uh, device management. Um, one of the key drivers for uh, Cyber Essentials Plus is uh, mobile device management. And with everybody working remotely, uh, clamping down on, on people using these devices to access company data uh, is, is quite vital. I've had a number of clients that haven't had the opportunity to roll out an MDM solution or Intune or something like that. And we've had discussions with IASMI recently. They've come back and given us a steer that basically says, um, as long as an organization has a written policy that is provided to employees that they sign up against, basically for using their own uh, mobile devices for uh, BYOD or, or you know um, business purposes, that that will actually contribute towards Cyber Essentials Plus as evidence that you're doing something to still secure those devices. So you don't necessarily have to have an MDM solution in place to be able to wipe the device. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. And obviously with COVID and the masses of people now working from home, it has you know resulted in a few pain points um, when implementing Cyber Essentials. But I, I think it, it's in a much better position now. And I think all the assessors are in a good place to be able to assist organisations with the implementation of the controls, whether people are in the office or working from home. But I think fundamentally with BYOD, the view of, of IASME and the NCSC is that if, if your device has business data on it, the controls still very much apply, be it a policy or a, a technical control. Brilliant. Thank you for that, uh, that point, Alex. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, just um, just a couple of questions for you then, Chris. Um, what would you say the, bene the main benefits of Cyber Essentials are? Um, well, I, I think certainly de demonstrating the due diligence and the best, best practice cyber in terms of specific cyber controls, even if you don't want to go down the route of certification, it's good to show that you've you've taken that due diligence and you've looked at these controls and implemented them where possible. Because worst case scenario, if, if something did happen and it did lead to some sort of investigation from the ICO, you've got that evidence there to back up. Well, actually, we you know we have taken some measures, we have taken some preventative steps. But also from a, I think from a, a commercial perspective, it, it can open you up to new contracts potentially. Mm. Um, and that I think I think one of the main reasons that certainly businesses will achieve Cyber Essentials Plus is, is for that commercial, you know, they've got a contractual requirement that means they've got to meet the requirements of Cyber Essentials Plus or Cyber yeah. Essentials. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a good point. So where do you think most people fail with Cyber Essentials? Um, I, I think a lot of it is down to end of life operating systems and, and applications um, and, and just a general lack of I guess housekeeping around patch management and things like that, that, that does sometimes pop up. And I, I think, yeah, hmm. that's, it, is, it is an issue in a lot of cases, but it's, you know, it's achievable. That's, that's the main thing. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. There's been a lot of um, brilliant side chat going on. And I think, uh, you know, if people haven't had an opportunity to go and take a look at that, I would, um, I, I would suggest that you do take a look. Some people are talking about NIST and whether NIST and, uh, is a better framework than 27001 and will 27001 start to incorporate some NIST controls. 27001 is due for um, a new release and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, moving forward. Let's hope some lessons have been learnt um, uh, around some of the other frameworks that are, are out there, but I'm starting to... Um, I've always believed in the standards themselves as a you know, great business uh, benefit as a framework in general terms. You know, whether you agree with the word standards or not is as a framework for organizations and um, they can be get more and more prescriptive and descriptive as they go in. And Cyber Essentials is a great example of, uh, of that, which has already been said, it's been mandated by many organizations. Um, okay, so um, moving on then. So thank you ever so much, Chris. That's brilliant um presentation um so now we come to uh, a piece which has been uh, introduced uh, by uh, stuart colson unfortunately stuart can't be with us today um 
This is Cyber Room 404. Um, if you're not aware of the concept, uh, most of us would think that uh, would uh, remember, I hope, the TV program Room 101, where celebrities come along and talk about the things that they would they either love or hate, um, usually what they hate, and they'd like to see that be thrown into Room 101 uh, to be lost forever, to never be seen again. So um, the idea here is that we have a Cyber Room 404 and we're looking for your suggestions about things you would like to see being thrown into room 404. We've got we've had a couple of suggestions already. Um, Jason is going to lead us through this. Um, uh, Connor, I don't think we can throw users in there because I think you know we would we would we'd all be out of work. But anyway, <laughs> um, maybe maybe Jason will take, pick on that. But Jason, over to you for Cyber Room 404. Thank you very much, Gary, and uh, thanks to all the speakers we've, we've had. Um, the first suggestion for Room 404 that I've had is from David Parrish. David, are you still there? Yeah, I'm with you. I didn't realise I would be picked, Jason. <laughs> well, I thought I would have been sacked um, by now. You've picked on one of my topics, so a good chance for a debate. Your, your comment was that disaster recovery is the wrong terminology to describe a cyber-related incident. Yeah. So if we uh, move it into our standards, we, we, we pick up on, as Gary said, 27001. Uh, down it, it goes, you've got to have business resilience, business continuity, but it doesn't give you any detail. You open up business continuity standard, uh, where there is that detail, and it talks about disaster recovery in an IT framework. People get confused. Everyone thinks disaster recovery is a flood, a natural disaster, you know, something tangible. And when we actually really should be looking in business resilience, and what are we testing? Yeah, we're testing, and we'll go back to it, confidentiality, integrity and availability it's not a disaster yeah it's not disaster recovery if you've got the right controls in so i don't like the phrase and i'm going to stick with language is important because once you set yourself on a track i'm not a politician uh so i'm going to hang my hat on disaster recovery it's the wrong word people don't understand it they switch off it doesn't resonate with them because they can't see a natural disaster. Well, I'm very pleased to see that and the, the, the terminology you've used here, you've actually taken on board my very first suggestion for Room 404, which is the use of the word cyber attack. And you've said cyber related incidents. So I feel somewhat vindicated in that. But has anybody got any comments for David to either agree or disagree with his thoughts? You know, as a provider, I, I think everyone agrees. I think everyone is in agreement. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> in that case, then I shall, I shall have to um, popular opinion and allow disaster recovery being the wrong terminology to be put into room 404. Excellent. Um, very good, David. Luke, did you have something that you wanted to put in? Uh, at the moment, I'm uh, I'm torn, but I'm just going to come back to. I'm going to loop back around that in a second because I just to make sure it's not going to be covered elsewhere. Okay. <clears throat> in that case, the, the next one that was raised by Gary, Gary would like business continuity planning to be put into room four hundred four. I feel um, like I'm being picked on here today, guys. Yeah. Well, it's it, listen. I I I love business continuity. I I've, again, I I've, uh, you know I I published author in it and I've. I've worked in the space for a long time. I just think it's now time. Uh, and David's, David actually said it better than I did with that diagram at the beginning of his. You know, it's, it's the organizational resilience. It's not just one thing, not just business continuity planning. And far too often when I hear about business continuity planning, it's a business continuity planner sitting on their own, dreaming up various different scenarios and then not really to engaging with other areas of the business like cybersecurity like the facilities team, like the compliance team. So it's no, it's that business continuity planning 
just simply throwing that um, into uh, into the room 404, and let's broaden the conversation. Let's start looking at you know a integrated um, uh, management system, an integrated approach to minimising risks. That's that's kind of my my thought. That's the reason why I said throw business continuity in there. Okay, I do like the term organisational resilience as a broader scope. I would have to speak to uh, my colleagues as we provide disaster recovery solutions about renaming the whole piece. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I know Rob Osborne's on here and I know Rob's got some fairly strong uh, background in um, business continuity and DR and all these things. I don't know if Rob wants to wade in and agree or disagree with me. I'm picking on him now and see if he's actually paying attention. <laughs> He's here. Can't hear you, Rob. Can't hear you, Rob. He needs a contingency plan for his earphones, you see. <laughs> you see, now is that a text but is that a technical issue? Is that a training issue? Where are we? You know, if he had a contingency plan, that would just only only look after one thing. Exactly. Bit bit, bit more organizational resilience uh, required there. So I will I think the two things, can I just chip in, Gary? I think the two things potentially are different things thinking about. And I've just, just sprung this on me. So um, organizational resilience is about the organization surviving. And I had a customer ask me if I could help with the business continuity plan this time last year. And I said, what happens if your owner gets COVID and dies? You know, they found, found and, and, and operate with the business. So business continuity is, a, is, a, is probably a, a subset of organizational resilience. So it's how would the the business continue to function in the event of systems going missing, facilities going down, people disappearing. An organizational resilience is you know, more than that. It's riding out financial shocks, for instance. It's, 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 much, it's a different thing. So I'm not in favor of chucking it in 404. So I think it has a place, but as a subset of organizational resilience. That's off the top of my head. I have not, I'm not a published author in this field. <laughs> that, uh, well, Jason, it's your decision, sir. Um, well, have, I think having... Um acceded to David's use of disaster recovery, I'm going to actually agree with Philip and say one is a subset of the other, so we need to keep them both. Sorry, Gary. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'll, take it. Um, I'll, take that. I'll take that. If we've got time for um, a few more, um, one from the chat. Stuart Smiles wants to put ransomware in room 404. Anybody object to that? Well, Stuart needs to tell us why he wants it in there first. Is he around? Sorry, I was just delivering pizza. <laughs> <laughs> why, why would you want to put ransomware into room 404? Um, I would say that ransomware is going to be the bane of very a lot of people's lives very quickly. And as a result, it... Um, has the capacity to destroy organizations at a moment's notice and organizations are not in any way ready for what they are required to do to mitigate it <coughs> i agree i agree and so therefore, they need to pay the ransom um, at the moment until they've got a viable solution to what is um, a big threat okay well having recently had a a, a customer who discovered that um, just having a backup was insufficient to recover effectively and quickly from ransomware and they could have been have had a, a much more robust disaster recovery solution uh, I can't see any argument for keeping ransomware around. Let's get rid. So I'm all for putting well, that. Chris, in Chris, has made a good, Chris has made a good point. You know, if you get rid of ransomware and similar threats, we'd all be out of a job. <laughs> now they'll, they'll still find something else to keep us busy. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that's what antivirus software companies do at all, by the way. I'm not saying that they create viruses and put them out there so that they can solve them. I'm no. not suggesting that for one moment. But, you know, Chris is right. We'd all be very bored if there was no ransomware, wouldn't we? <laughs> Perhaps the issue is um, that it's become a good way to earn money um, 
However, at the same time, the threat to the organisation is somewhat significant. Mm. Yes. Um, thinking, thinking back to probably about. You can't, you can't, you can't remove it just because you don't like it. It, it, uh, the, the problem is, it's an actual risk that really could impact the organisation, and there's very little mitigation in the majority of organisations there, and they're not ready for it. Yeah. Thinking back to to uh, when Crypto Locker first came out, I believe it was heralded as um, the uh, best business model ever. I think it made twenty four and a half million pounds in about three months. Indeed. Um, Luke, uh, you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, yeah, that was actually uh, pre this discussion. Um, oh, look, right. Sorry. But I'm going to throw, throw my two bit anyway. Uh, look, I, I, as David, um, I've come from law enforcement, so I've seen what, um, I've dealt with quite a few ransomware attacks where small businesses have actually been targeted. And look, the, the government's line, and for the most part, the line is don't pay the ransom. And I, and I agree in principle behind that. But from my perspective, I think it needs to be a business led decision um, on whether they should or should not. Because if the life of that business depends on paying the ransom versus not, how, you know, I, I think it, it's great for us to say don't pay the ransom. And I, again, I agree in principle. But if they don't, um, and it could be the operational downtime could actually result in the business going under, which is a smarter option. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Chris? Yeah, just on the, the paying of the ransom, um, I was actually listening to a, a talk from uh, some law firms recently about ransomware and paying the ransom. And I didn't know this, but it's, the, the, you know how you get lists of like embargoed countries where you're not allowed to do trade with them. Effectively, a lot of these ransomware operators are now implicated in these embargoed lists. So to make the payment, you might actually be committing a more significant criminal offence now. So mm -hmm. it's actually... You know, it's made matters even more difficult because they're having to hire law firms to work out well what's the the best way forward and what's the the legal way forward without getting ourselves into a an even bigger mess than we're already in. Like yeah, the, the the model has changed significantly, and even cyber criminals are recognising that law firms and insurers are advising you know that you you can pay the the ransom and such. And um, again, we all we're all sat on a very thin ethical line here. We all know principally what is right and wrong, but we also uh, the realist in us all probably says, "Well, we understand why a company would do it um, uh, for for the reasons Luke's already mentioned." But even cyber criminals now are, are saying, "You know, look, if we hit you with ransomware, your insurer will pay up because we are an ethical cri uh, crime group." You know, ethical criminals is the is you know the oxymoron of the day really isn't it um but they recognize it's a business model they don't see us as as victims they see us as clients and um it's that that is that's ransomware it, that's the evolution of cyber crime or the evolution of crime into cyber or antivirus yeah yeah very true <laughs> so jason um does are we putting ransomware in there <clears throat> I think the thing we have to really we don't we, you know, we'd like to be able to to get rid of it. So in principle, yes. I, I do like Alex's comment. I don't know if you've seen it in the chat about negotiator as a service. Since we've got everything else as a service these days, you've got ransomware as a service. Why not negotiator as a service? Hang on a minute. I'm just going to get that URL. I'm just going to buy that. Just hang on a minute. <laughs> so, so just interestingly, uh, I did actually have to do a uh, negotiation. Um, one of my functions when I was in the police was a hostage and crisis negotiator. Um, and a, it was one of the first ransomware attacks that the police had actually seen in South Yorkshire at the time. Uh, and they actually went down the route of actually negotiating with uh, the criminals um, who was doing a DDoS against a, an ISP. Um, it didn't work very well at all because they didn't need our uh, intervention at all. But it's an interesting concept and it will be interesting to see how it's actually uh, potentially progressible now knowing that you've got that uh, criminal model between uh, criminal and the uh, the victim, that line of communications now there. Yeah, I would completely agree. change it to having it as um, the official line on ransomware that you don't pay the ransom and having a more adult discussion about it. Yeah. Was that a question, sorry, Stuart? Um, 
what to put into room 101. Right, okay. Jason, thoughts? Um, yeah, have we got time for one more, Gary? Um, I, I think only for a very quick one then. Let's go for a quick one if you want to throw that in. Okay, it's slightly off topic, slightly different. Somebody has suggested that we would like to throw jazz into room 404. Whoever <laughs> put that one forward, please own up and justify yourself. What's wrong with jazz? Oh, it's just made up. It's not real music. Just trad jazz. It's, you know, it's people say it's, it's traditional jazz and I just say it's tragic jazz. It's just, no, it's not real music. Yeah, I always say there's a thing right. where... All music is made up. I mean, made up on the spot. I've been to a few jazz places, and these guys are just making it up. So, you should be able yeah. to tell you there's the music. As an extra professional, can I chip in? As an ex-professional musician, like, jazz, it's great, but everyone picks their own key, their own speed, and it's a race to the end. Oh, wow. Fantastic. There you go. Name any other discipline, any other thing, Connor, in the world that you said that that's what they do, and then you'd just go, well, that's stupid. That's crazy. You know, that's just, yeah. And you're a professional musician, you see? Yeah, no. Ex professional musician. I tell you what, of all the conversations we've had today, there's more going on in the chat on this. And the general consensus of opinion, Gary, is that you're right. So I'm going to bow to popular opinion and allow you to put jazz into room. 404. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions. If anybody has any such <laughs> things they would like to, to put in, brilliant. In future, Thank you. Get in touch with us. Gary, back to you. Thanks ever so much, Jason. That was uh, expertly done. And thanks, everyone, for your contributions as well in there. Um, so, um, okay, so upcoming events uh, and topics for 2021. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you may recognise some of these topics here as being the uh, ISO 27001, but that's not the focus of uh, the cyber cluster. They are merely a framework in which we want to explore different aspects of cyber security. So uh, we are looking for speakers on any of these uh, topics. Um, uh, David and Philip uh, kindly came along to, the, uh, to, to this, and Chris did a great job as well. You know, they've done... They volunteered to speak about their particular um, uh, areas of expertise based around standards. So in March, we're going to be looking at system acquisition, development and maintenance. If you're unsure what that is, first and foremost, go and take a look at what ISO 27001 says it is, and then you may agree or disagree. But fundamentally, we wanted to hear from you, um, uh, those of you specifically in the more technical uh, arena. So anybody who's, in the, who's um, a developer, a uh, tester, for instance, um, any engineers that we have out there, anybody developing any, any cool apps and services. And we'd just love to know your take on ensuring that what you're developing is done so in a confidential uh, integrity, availability, and a safety kind of framework. Um, so come forward volunteer come and speak you know you've seen the format the the, the, the structure five minutes with a few questions um uh, thrown at you for good measure and we're going to be talking in april more about human resource security again it's not just talking about it from a 27001 perspective or from a framework perspective it is maybe touching on the more human aspects and we i saw earlier on in the chat people talking about training and some people say that people are the weakest link, some people disagreeing with that. Well, if you agree or disagree, come along and talk and pitch your case and tell us why and how we can improve security. And you can see the other uh, topics that we're going to be going through there. So again, we don't want to just look at focus on one standard. We want to look at this at a, at a technical level as well. So give us your views and please come along.